it's your first time, we are so glad to have you with us. Last weekend, it was such a blessing to be able to see so many of you here and get to witness just how many students, teachers, and administrators are in our midst. It was a joy to pray over you and celebrate togetherness with you as we were reminded why we worship. I'm excited to enter into this next season with you, ready for all God will do. And friends, I know there are many things each of you juggle on a daily basis. Some of it is the external, the to-dos and the tasks. Some of it's internal, like health issues, doubt, or longing for something different. We're each looking for tools and ways to be equipped to navigate it better. And this September, you have an opportunity for you and your family to do just that through the fall session of F3 Family Faith Formation. Adults can engage in classes like Contagious Faith and Gospel of Mark, or Nehemiah, A Heart That Can Break, or grow and deepen your relationship with God and others through the Rooted Experience, offered both Wednesday evenings and Thursday mornings. Kids and youth can spend time with Jesus and friends, along with the SPL Kids and SPL Youth Teams. Classes for every age and stage meet on Wednesdays at 6.30 with dinner at 5.30 p.m. beginning September 14th. And there's also opportunities to serve during this time. You can be part of the SPL Kids Team or mentoring youth. Or if you have a heart for hospitality, come be a part of the kitchen crew and help with dinner each week. Even more, everyone is welcome. Each of you knows another person who is struggling through some of the same things you are. Invite him or her to be part of this experience too. Grab a few copies of the course descriptions and take a look at what's available to you and what may benefit someone you know. Then register at the tables in the fellowship area or online at spldecatororg slash forms. There are also ways for you to experience community and plenty of fun. So grab your running shoes or walking shoes and a light colored shirt and get your family and friends together 9 a.m. on September 10th at SPL. Join the neighborhood outreach team for the family fun 5K color run or walk. You'll have a great time here on campus out in God's creation and come out looking like a work of art. Register now. You can find all the details about this and everything happening around SPL inside your worship guide. Find this and more at spldecatororg slash church online. And finally, we love to know that you're worshiping with us. So if you're here for the first time, please take a moment to complete a first time guest card and return it to our Welcome Center for a special gift. If you already consider yourself family, please complete a connect card here in person or online. And as always, let us know how we can be praying for you. to be worshiping with you today. We are uh, in the middle of a series all about worship, learning about what it looks like to receive the gifts of God and to reflect those things back to Him. And I'm so excited to be doing that alongside of you today, to be worshiping our Lord and Savior. Hey, before we get started in worship, I would just encourage you, stand up, uh, shake a hand, share a name. I know it's a little bit rainy this morning, but we gotta, we gotta get going.
begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, be in this place. Fill our hearts and our lives with your worship. Do not allow us to leave here unchanged, but use this time to mold us, to shape us into the people that you long for us to be. We pray this in your mighty and precious name. Amen. You know, Scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us, to make us new, to take away all of our unrighteousness. So we go before our Father and confess our sins. Most merciful Father, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. And it's for his sake that he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I announce to you today that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the word of God. Psalm 99 begins with the words, the Lord reigns, and it proclaims him king over all creation. It highlights God's holiness, which evokes awe, reverence, and even fear. He alone is worthy of worship, prayer, and devotion. Although Moses, Aaron, and Samuel are mentioned, the Psalm cannot be dated nor identified with any particular historical event. These men represent the priestly and prophetic offices of ancient Israel and demonstrate both God's justice and forgiveness for his people. We read from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The early Christians lived only for their Lord and for other members of his body, the church. How cheap in comparison is our indifference to the church. How sad are our compromises with this world. 
yet the Holy Spirit still dwells and works among us. We still have the apostles' teaching embodied in the New Testament scriptures. How blessed are we in such heavenly fellowship. May the Lord open our eyes to his reality, order our priorities, and let Christ's light transfigure these latter days. We read from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of respect for Jesus and his words of life, we stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading comes to us today from the gospel of John, the fourth chapter. Jesus is having conversation with the, the woman at the well. And the woman asks, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. Together we declare the truth about our God through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
all of the following things have in common. Can you think of what they all have in common? Each of these activities are times and ways that you can worship God. Those activities might look like doing homework, playing sports, or singing songs, but they can be much more when we turn our attention to God as we do them. Since God is always with us, we can always worship Him no matter what we're doing. So instead of just shooting a basketball, Thank God for the breath in your lungs, the muscles in your legs, and your eyes to see the ball. Instead of just playing an instrument, make music to Jesus. Instead of just sitting outside, think about verses that say how good God is at making the world. Instead of just playing on the playground, talk to your friends about how amazing God is and show them what his love looks like by being kind to them while you play. Worship isn't just something that we do on the weekend. We can worship God every single day of the week because worship is more than just about singing loud. It's all about living loud. See ya. Well, it is amazing that we can worship God in many different ways. And one of the ways that we do worship our Lord and Savior is through our generosity, reflecting back to him, his generosity. And so I encourage you today to, to be generous and continue to support the ministry here at SPL as we continue to do the work that God has called us to do. Uh, today, as you leave, you can leave your offerings in the boxes by the door. And the great news I want to announce as well is that in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start passing the offering plate once again because we know that that is such an act of worship as well. So look forward to that in the next few weeks as we begin to pass that offering plate once again. I know many of you feel that that's something that needs to happen, and I do too. So I'm happy to say that we will be doing that soon. But we thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support of the ministry. And today we continue to talk about ways that we worship. So grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I introduced the series where I introduced the idea of what is worship. And we're going to review that in just a moment. But last week, Pastor Bill actually gave a great message on understanding that God is in all of our circumstances. And therefore, because God is in every one of our circumstances, we actually can worship God no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. And today what we're going to focus on is the idea of worshiping and the place that God calls us to worship in. Where does he call us to worship and where is worship allowed to be or should be, we might say. It's interesting because the song we just sang at the beginning of worship was what? Anybody remember? Look at your folder, you can say it out loud. Yeah, in the temple, right? Okay, so here I come, right? So here we're talking about where do we go to worship. And I think today you'll understand that worship, we have a lot of flexibility on. So let's dig into this just a little bit. Just a reminder of what worship is. We said in the first week that worship is the activity of glorifying God in his presence with our voice and our hearts. And if you remember how we defined this, we said that, that the, it is an activity. It's something that we do, not because we're earning salvation or anything else from it, but it's a response because of what God has done for us, that we just can't help ourselves to worship God and praise him for all that he has done for us. And because this is an activity, it's done in the presence of God because as Bill was clear last week, God is present everywhere. God is throughout this world. God also, through his Holy Spirit, lives in each one of us. So wherever we are is where God is and his presence is. And here one of our core values is God's presence because we know that God is alive here. Yes, God is alive right here in this sanctuary, but God is also alive in us and wherever we go in this community. And the idea we said of voices and hearts gets to the idea that voices and hearts mean it's everything about us. It's using our voice in singing praise, speaking about the glory of God, always pointing to God in everything, and using everything about us because we just can't help 
but praise our Lord for all that he has done. You guys say amen? So part of that is a direct expression as well of our ultimate purpose for living. The reason that you and I are here and have been saved is that we can point to the glory of God and always give praise to him and worship him. That's why we are here is to constantly be doing that. And part of that is an outward display of our inward belief. We can say, yes, we believe in God. We can say, I love Jesus and all that he has done for us. But there truly is this outward expression of what that means. I mean, think about it in your household. If you never saw an outward expression from your significant other of the love that they have for you, how would you feel? Probably not very good, right? See, the Lord also, the way we show our inward belief is through an outward expression and display through worship him. It's a way that we can show what we truly believe to everyone who's around us and show who we truly are worshiping and who we truly believe in. This is what worship is. And as I define worship, one thing I want to define for today too is this idea of what is the church. So think about that just for a moment. How would you define the church? What is the church? If worship is everything we've just talked about, then what is the church? I mean, many people would look at this building and say this building is a church. And yes, we look at this building and as we drive up, we say we're going to church. And we would call this building the church. But the true definition of church is the people of God. That the true definition of what the church is, is it's all of us who believe in Jesus. Us together, we are the church. And this building is a building where we as God's people come into. And why this is called a church is because we are here, gathered as God's people. And so if this church ceased to exist, if this building ceased to exist, we would still be a church because of us here as believers in God, believers together. That the church is the people of God. And so today I want to make sure that that definition is clear, that truly the church is us, those who are gathered in his name. And what are we called to do? Well, This was the least threatening picture of an octopus I could find. (laughs) But this actually is what the church is called to be. Sort of an octopus where our tentacles go out into the community and everywhere around as we share the love of Christ and we worship God throughout this community and everything that we do, every way that we live, that the tentacles actually can't help but spread throughout all of this community as we spread out as the church in this community and reach people all around us and share his love and grace and worship him for what he has done for us. It's sort of interesting when we think about the church itself being an octopus with tentacles being out. It shows that we are meant not just to be here and be here, the church, which isn't a good way to say that, but I'm saying it that way, that we are more than the church in this place. We are meant to be the church out in the community and everywhere that we live. Today we're going to go back to that text from John chapter 4. I encourage you to pull out your Bibles if you would. If you brought them with you, great. If not, there's a pew Bible in front of you. If you have your phone or another device, you can pull it out there. John chapter 4, and the reason we go to this book is because this is the greatest book ever written. And every word of it is true. Can we say amen? So we're going back to the verse that we started with in John chapter 4. And we're going back there because as as he is speaking to, as Jesus is speaking to this woman at the well, after he's shown her all this grace and, and love, he comes to this point where she asks about worship, actually. And Jesus gives an answer to it that is something we should pay attention to. So let's look at these verses beginning at John chapter 4, verse 20, is where we were going to begin. And it reads this. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. 
We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We go back to this verse because it, it really is interesting as we look at this that beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 4, we see this beautiful encounter between Jesus and this woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, someone who he really wasn't supposed to be engaging with and talking with. But he exhorts to the woman, woman, believe me, he says. And by the way, when Jesus says, woman, believe me, what should we probably do? Pay attention, right? He's calling attention to this. This is something that he really wants us to hear. And he says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The expression, believe me, is important, calling your attention to this. He talks about the hour as well, that the hour is coming. And usually when John uses the term the hour, he's bringing up this idea of when Jesus is going to be glorified in some way. It's the glorification of Jesus. And in fact, some people believe that at this point, he's pointing to a time when this will happen that will happen after the crucifixion and after the resurrection that that is when the hour will come, that it is here, but the true point will be after Jesus has been resurrected and glorified. And at that point, he says that things will be different, that the hour will come and it'll be new. He says these words, remember, he says as well, our fathers worship, she says, on this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. There was a confusion and sort of an argument going on at the time of where do we truly worship? And Jesus responds to this woman with a place of worship. But see, she expected it to be on the mountain, and the Jewish people some expected it to be at the temple. There were places that they were told they were supposed to worship. I mean, that once there was a temple on this mountain near Shechem that, that she said we should be worshiping at, that that's where they should be worshiping the Lord. But the Jews said, no, you've got to go to Jerusalem. And many people flocked to Jerusalem and worshiped there. And yes, there was this conflict that was going on on where true worship actually takes place. And Jesus' statement to the woman clearly asserts the worship of God is not about venues, sites, or structures. Thus says, he says, the hour is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He's telling her that it's not going to be the way that it used to be. It's not going to be on this mountain. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. There is a new way that is going to be worshiping God. It's going to be in spirit and in truth is how we do it, as we heard before. But the statement underscores that there is a new way of worshiping. It stresses the point that such places, such as the temple or others, don't make our worship more better, you might say, than other places. That God can be worshipped, in fact, anywhere where God's people are located. That the hour is coming where you can worship God no matter where you are at. And yes, there are great places that we can gather, and we are encouraged to constantly never neglect coming together as the body of believers and worshiping God right here in this place. But you can worship God also in your homes online. You can worship God anywhere as, as God's people comes together and worship the Lord, but we are also encouraged to come together once a week as God's people right here. It's amazing as I, as I hear this and I think about this, I can't help but think about the time that I spent four days with Francis Chan and his elders in San Francisco. There they, they started planting house churches as a way to reach people in the neighborhoods that didn't know Jesus. And they had 27 house churches that were being built and actually growing starting from one small church now to 27 because they were reaching people who didn't know Jesus and the spirit was alive in them. 
I mean, they were functioning in a way that most people would not understand, just gathering in homes. And this reminds me of what happens in the, in the book of Acts as we see the apostles in the early church. If you look at the account of the early church, they survived through a period of persecution, of physical restrictions on what they could do as people. On account of their faith, they actually still continued to gather. And they gathered in homes. Homes worshiping God in those locations. It began with the healing of the cripple at the gate. Peter, he goes out and he provides this amazing sermon. As I said to my the Bible study class I do, I would love to, as a pastor, give a sermon like Peter where 5,000 people come to faith. But that's what Peter did. And afterwards, they seized him, the, the religious leaders did, and they sort of threatened him that he had to stop what he was doing, but Peter wasn't going to have any of that. And when they released him and John, guess what it says they did? It says they went to their own. In other words, if you look at the true text of Greek, it says they went to their own homes is what they're suggesting. And when they went to their homes, the first thing they did was they worshiped the Lord right there in their homes singing praises to God, praying to him, and worshiping him. They did it in any believer's home that they were allowed to do so. Not a designated worship center, but in the home of the Christians that were there. See, whether they were in the temple or they were at home, they used the same opportunity to proclaim the name of Jesus. The early believers recognized that their rejection was something to be anticipated. That it was going to get worse for them over time, not better. And as it gets worse for them, persecuted more, pushed to the margins of society even more, they had to find new ways to proclaim Jesus, new ways to worship Jesus. And so what they did was they went and saw what homes they could worship in. Acts chapter 2 points this out, as we just heard in our text, as they shared everything together, but they met in their homes, and they shared meals together, and they worshiped together, and they prayed together. They used this opportunity to proclaim the name of Jesus right in their neighborhoods, knowing that they were worshiping in spirit and the truth. And even when Peter and John and others were persecuted... And they were sent to prison that didn't stop them there either they didn't think they had to be in the temple to worship God even in the midst of the prison walls that they found themselves in they were physically locked up and under chains but still they found ways to worship the Lord in that circumstance and in that setting they didn't see it as an opportunity to say, you know what, we're not in the house of the Lord right now. But truly, they made the cells that they were in truly houses of the Lord as they worshiped the Lord right there in that place. Acknowledging that they were the body of Christ. That they truly were together where one or two are gathered are able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And in those locations, they freely worshiped and praised God and made a difference in the people that saw them right around them and the great thing is for you and I living today we can respond in the same way by forming communities of fellowship of Christians together worshiping the Lord not just in this place but throughout this community in all aspects of our lives we're wherever we are Opening our homes to our neighbors and sharing prayer and a meal and a time of worship of the Lord with them right in our neighborhoods. Not just waiting to worship here on Sunday, but using every day of our lives as an opportunity to worship the Lord because it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter the setting that we have. Everything doesn't have to be perfect. What truly needs to happen is that we worship in spirit and truth wherever we find ourselves. See, the amazing thing is we find freedom in this. Freedom to gather anywhere. In fact, we see in the book of Acts as well, Paul and his companions ministered to some women by the river 
And when they did so, worship broke out right there in that location. They praised the Lord God right by a riverbank. And then they actually used that river to baptize the women that were there. Amazing things happen when we worship the Lord, not just in this place, but throughout the community. As we feel freedom to do so and understand that we have freedom to worship the Lord in any setting and in any place. And see, we learn that truly linking ourselves as the body of Christ to not just one location, but any location, gives us the ability to proclaim Jesus anywhere and everywhere, each and every day. See, here we have to understand that he turned the emphasis from the place of worship to truly the object of worship. And so, Whenever we're, there are two or three that come together, Jesus is there with us. And it's not about the place of worship. It's always about the object of our worship. Jesus Christ being that object. That truly all of our worship is focused on spirit and truth as we put our focus on Jesus, as we always point to glorify him. And our worship is not about any place at all. Our worship is all about the object. And if we didn't learn that during COVID, I don't know what will help us learn that. See, through COVID, we learn that we truly can worship God anywhere. That we can worship God in our homes through the online service. And those of you who are watching online today, you are worshiping God. And that is just as valid as sitting here today. But yet still God calls us to come together when we can. That we don't neglect coming to this place, worshiping together, but also living our lives, worshiping God everywhere that we go. And that there is no human agent or condition or situation or creation that can cut us off from Christ or lock Christ out of our lives and make him inaccessible to us in any way. Nor can any one or circumstance make us disconnect from each other. And it's important that we realize that because we are in Christ and Christ lives in us through his spirit, that there is nothing that will ever separate us from Christ. And that because of that, we can always worship him no matter where we are, but also we can understand that we are never going to be disconnected from each other because we are always called to come together as the body of Christ and worship together in this place. See, I pray that this message today, that what it does is it allows us to understand that, yes, worshiping here is tremendous, but also worshiping in our community, in our homes, that that can be tremendous as well. And I pray that today you would find ways to worship the Lord, not just for one hour here on Sunday morning, but that we would open our homes to worship. We would open our lives to worship the Lord all throughout the week with all those that God has placed around us. Would you bow your heads and pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for the grace and the love that you have shown us. The truly, Lord, we, we hear this message of worship is not about us being in this building, but truly, Lord, worship is how we live our lives each and every day. And so, Lord, help us to have homes that truly are houses that are houses of worship. We might call them house churches, Lord, where we can worship our Lord and Savior there. The Lord, we would do that with our families each and every day, but Lord, maybe we would also invite neighbors in as well so that they could worship the Lord there and come to know him. The Lord, help us to come together here as well. That when we are able, Lord, that we can truly come and gather as your body of Christ right here to be built up and encouraged. And Lord, we just thank you for this great place that you give us to worship but broaden our minds to know that this is not the only place, that the hour has come for us truly to worship the Father and worship you, Jesus, all throughout this community each and every day. Help us to make that difference, and Lord, help us to live in your love and grace more and more. And we pray this all in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. I would invite you to stand as we go before our King in prayer.
Well, Jesus, we know that you are in all things and you were before all things and in you all things hold together. And Lord, uh, today we acknowledge that we need you to hold all things together. We need you to hold this world together as there's division and there's war and there's conflict. And Lord, we pray that you as Prince of Peace would bring your peace to rule and reign in this world. Lord, we need you to hold together uh, our lives as we continue to, to share your love and your grace and your mercy. There are those in our midst who are hurting, who are in need of healing. We pray for Lincoln and Pastor Gary, for Tom and Jerry and Jeff and Tanya. Lord, we lift up Lee and Donna and Rod and Rebecca and Michelle and all of those who are in the hearts and minds of God's people. Lord, we also lift up Timothy, Timothy, praying that you would bring him healing. And Lord, we lift up those who are suffering loss. We lift up uh, the family and friends of Wanda as she went to be with you uh, a couple of days ago. Lord, we pray that you would wrap your loving arms around your family. Let them know that they are there, that you are there, even in their loss. Lord, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. You do provide and you do hold it together. We thank you for the, uh, the celebration of 59 years uh, of Bob and Joan Shanefeld's wedding, Jean Shanefeld. Lord, we also thank you for the 28th wedding anniversary of Paul and Julie Butler. Lord, we pray that you would bless all of them, bring them together closer towards you and closer towards each other. Lord, we lift up all these things to you, knowing that you are good. We are bold to pray the prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. In the same way after supper, he took the cup when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, welcome to the Lord's table. You may be seated.
Now may this true body and true blood of our Savior Jesus strengthen you and preserve you and keep you strong in the faith to life everlasting. Go in his joy and in his peace. Amen. Hey, I'd invite you to stand for the last hymn. Amen. I don't presume to know what heaven is going to be like, but I'm fairly certain we're going to be singing that song. You know? Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Hey, uh, receive this blessing from our Savior. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his unending peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, just a reminder, we're not we're not done with this whole church thing. I mean, like we're done in this room, but if you want to be a part of Sunday school, that would be an incredible thing. We would love to have you in pastor's class. Uh, we'd love to have you in confirmation and the youth group class and in the parent time. Uh, just find somewhere to be, get plugged in and be a part of. All right, go in peace and serve the Lord.